I gave you a little introduction. Okay. <laughs> so I'd like to uh, welcome each and every one of you today. And on behalf of myself, Bob Ives, and the Old Bristol Historical Society, I'd like to not only welcome you, but thank you all very, very much for coming to this sadly last of our talks during the summertime of Bristol and the history of Maine in general. So before I introduce Chip, let me just give one little advertisement, and that is that there's a lot of merchandise uh, from the Old Bristol Historical Society that makes excellent uh, Christmas presents or whatever you would like, but we're still selling those as quickly as we can. In any event, we're delighted to have Chip Griffin here with us. That would be Carl R. Griffin <laughs> III, but most people it's know Chip. him as Chip. Please. So uh, Chip uh, was raised in Booth Bay Harbor, mm -hmm. went to Booth Bay Harbor High School, graduated in 1973, went on to Bowdoin College, uh, graduated in 1977, summa cum laude, and then went on to the University of Maine Law School in Portland, graduated in 1980, and then immediately after began his own law firm in Booth Bay Harbor. He's been there for 42 years. But Chip's not only a lawyer, but he's also an author. And Chip has written a number of different books, one of which is Coming of Age on Damariscove Island. Secondly, I'm Different, a biography of Ethlyn Giles. The third book he wrote, Lively Stones, the Evolution of the Congregational Church in Booth Bay Harbor from its origins in 1766 to 2016. And lastly, Reflections on 300 Years of the Scots-Irish in Maine, from 1718 to 2018, the topic, of course, of his talk tonight. But Chip is also writing a full history of Booth Bay Harbor region from prehistory to the present day. Chip has also been very active in community service organizations, both local and global, including Rotary, Rebuilding Together, Booth Bay Region Land Trust, Booth Bay Region YMCA, Elder Forum, and Safe Passage in Guatemala. He and his wife Denise have two daughters, and Chip has a lot of recreation by walking in all of the woods and paths of Booth Bay Harbor, and also he loves his chainsaw. <laughs> I do. So, would you join with me now in giving him a warm welcome? Thanks so much, Bob. That's tremendous. Um, I do want to uh, uh, mention John Atwood. A lot of you know John, probably, right? Novaboro was district attorney and uh, judge for many years. Um, anyway, great guy. And he's the one that's uh, responsible for getting me to do this talk because um, I, I'd known him a long time. In fact, I worked with him and I was really lucky, I tried all sorts of cases in district court in Bath um, because the district attorneys were, were busy doing other things and they needed me to do this stuff, which I didn't know what to do, but I, um, I had a little bit of help work in the clinic my first year, but this was just after my first year in law school. And so I was trying all these cases and negotiating a lot of cases in district court. And so uh, I would call the district attorney in Wiscasset who was around, to get a little bit of the lay of the land. And, um, and I'd gotten to know him quite well too, and, <clears throat> and he, me, but it was a real great learning experience. But um, he also said, you know, he told me who were the lawyers you could trust, and there were one or two you really couldn't trust. <laughs> and, and I learned that very quickly. <laughs> this guy told me, this attorney told me that he had a deal, he'd already worked it out with the district attorney, and, and I made a quick phone call and realized that was not the case. And <laughs> so I, I learned the easy way. But the point is, is that I had a, a, a lot of really good support there. But um, as Bob said, you know, my real love is, and passion has always been, it really is committed to community. That's what, that's what our motto has always been for the last 42 years. But, um, but part of that is our local history and, and uh, I would like nothing better, and I do now finally, after all these years, have a partner as of July uh, 1st of this year. He's great, high EQ, high IQ, and um, 
uh, I think that it'll be a lot easier for me to maybe ramp down a little bit from my general 12 hour days. So, um, and during the pandemic it was 12 to 15 hour days. It was horrendous. It was just uh, unbelievably crazy busy. So um, anyway, this is, this is my love. I have always really liked it. And, he, and I have to blame John Atwood on this one. He called me up and said, Chip, I'd like you to do something on the bicentennial. Well, this was just a few months before the pandemic hit. So it was um, in late 2019. And um, I said, John, I, you know, I really don't care about all this bicentennial hoopla. No, I'm not going to do that. And I knew him well enough, and he knew me, so it was fine. We just kept on talking and then about other things. And then as we were talking, I said, you know, John, I think I could do something about the bicentennial, but it's not going to be about the bicentennial. It's going to be about the decade leading up to 1820 when we separated from, from Massachusetts. Um, so what I did, in, in perhaps I had a lot of this research anyway. Part of the part of the problem that I have is that I've, I'm doing this impossible history. I don't know if it'll ever be published, and from prehistory to the present in the Booth Bay region. But it's really an excuse to write about the mid coast area and national, international, <laughs> global trends, and so forth from prehistory to the present. So it's kind of not very well. Um, narrowed. <laughs> so it's, uh, it's already over a thousand pages, over 5,000 endnotes, and it's nowhere near completed. <laughs> and I have these boxes and boxes of books that I've read for this that I haven't even incorporated into it yet. So, but anyway, what is good is that whenever anybody calls me and says, uh, do you have something on that? I could probably say, yes, probably I do. Uh, because you can just press control F and, you know, uh, copy and paste it. And there it is. And that happened, actually. There was a last fall, um, the Booth Hill Region Railway Village wanted me to speak. And the, it's the first time that I was assigned a topic. They said, could you speak uh, two separate times on you know, different, different eras um, on, the, uh, uh, on the topic that we've already called moonshine and whiskey? And I said, yeah, sure, I can do that. And, <laughs> and, and it was amazing because I think within a couple of hours, I had more than enough to you know, weave into a into a, a talk, and two talks. And uh, I mean, I had to f spend a lot more time fine tuning it, of course, but it was, uh, it, it, it was great. It was really a lot of fun. And, and they served uh, you know, a lot of whiskey um, as well afterwards. And uh, uh, so it was a real, real great event for, for the Booth Bay region. I highly commend it for anybody who wants to do something like that here. It was, it was a lot of fun. And there are so many things we have in common, you know, between Booth Bay and Wiscasa, uh, Booth Bay and, and uh, Bristol. Um, you know, we're both at the ends of the peninsulas. We did things so much together. In fact, uh, if, if you go back even further than what I'm going to be focused on, um, people knew each other more between the two peninsulas than they did, uh, you know, even, even um, in, in uh, a similar type of culture uh, in Jefferson and Whitefield, uh, because you just couldn't get up there. You know, it was the, the rivers just didn't run that well up there, and they could only get part way. So, <clears throat> in the in the early 1700s, you really uh, there were far more people from Bristol and Booth Bay who were marrying people up in Nova Scotia and Newfoundland than they were inland Maine, because you just couldn't get there from here. <laughs> As Tim Sample will remind us many times. But, um, so anyway, I kind of digress. But um, what, I, what I will do, and I, I do have copies. I think I've got enough for everybody. Um, uh, if you want them after, I can hand them out to you. But um, the, uh, I think what I'll do is I will probably read roughly half of what I've written on, on this um, and, and then yeah, because I'll do what I just did. I'll digress. So, <laughs> um, But I will try to stick a little bit closer to it. Um, and I'll start with, with two um, quotes that are very meaningful to me. Um, one was by uh, G.B. Ch Ch Chesterton. Um, and he, uh, he, 
he, G.K. Chesterton, he wrote this in 1933, says the disadvantage advantage of men not knowing the past is that they do not know the present. And understand, he wrote that in 1933. He should have said people. But uh, History is a hill or high point of vantage from which alone men can see the town in which they live and the age in which they are living. Um, and another one, one of my favorites, and uh, what, what an incredible man he was, and I'll, many of you have probably heard of him, Robert P. Tristram Coffin from Brunswick. Um, incredible poet. In fact, he won uh, the Pulitzer Prize uh, in 1951 for the green, green carpet. And, uh, and th this quote is, there is a strange holiness around our common days on common ground. Um, so anyway, I'm going to just dive in and what I, I really want to do is, is bring out the fact that you, you know, we all hear this all the time still, we are in the worst of times now. This is awful. And it is, it's, it's terrible. Many, many things in terms of what we're experiencing right now are really terrible, but they don't even come close to the depths that we've been in many years before this, um, and many times. This is just one example, but it's an example that I think will really hit home. So, um, main life in 1820 followed ten, 20 tempestuous years of political experimentation, threatened secession of New England from the Union, economic growth followed by the Panic of 1819, social upheavals, Mr. Madison's War, now known as the War of 1812, uh, some in-migration, followed by dramatic out-migration of particularly youth called the Ohio Fever, and the most traumatic climate, climate changes and challenges in over 1,300 years. Times are trying today, but not nearly as extreme and desperate as a hazardous life just before and after 1820. In 1813, Massachusetts had officially abolished corporal punishment, following decades of practical discontinuance for whipping, cropping, branding, standing in the pillory, and sitting upon the gallows. In what New Englanders called Mr. Madison's War before the War of 1812 was coined, a great number of soldiers was recruited for the army in this district of Maine, according to its population, than in any one of the states. This district of Maine militia in 1813 contained the largest number of soldiers being 21,121 men. British naval ships along Maine's coast and along the eastern seaboard of the, United, of the new United States for years prior to and during the war stopped American vessels, mustered American crews, and seized naval deserters or any British subjects. As maritime historian Roger Duncan, who was actually from Booth Bay Harbor, uh, pointed out, their methods of determining British citizenship were crude. Almost any stout American seaman could be quickly identified as a British subject. On one main vessel, the British could use any excuse to impress, namely capture Americans. Quotes, where are you from? Wells, Maine. I thought you looked like a Welshman. <laughs> and off he went to the British Navy. Early and earlier, in 1803, Booth Bay seaman Joseph Emerson was impressed from the Booth Bay schooner Harriet in St. Kitts, not escaping for another year. In 1804, the British impressed Sylvanus Snow, now also of Booth Bay, later captured by the French, taken to Spain, exchanged as a British seaman, tr t uh, put back aboard a British vessel, and fought at the Battle of Trafalgar in Spain. Emerson served in various vessels until 1811 at Menorca, an island in the Mediterranean Sea, where he escaped and, and arrived home to Booth Bay in a Novelborough vessel. <laughs> By 1808, Portland's five principal merchants lost their fortunes, the bank failed, and import duties had crashed from 342,909 in 1807 to a mere 4,369 in 1808. Ships were laid up and grass grew on deserted wharves. Off Wiscasset, in February of, of 1809, lay 32 loaded vessels due to no demand for their cargo. 
Fishermen, farmers, and lumbermen had no markets for their products and further suffered exploding prices for needed staples such as molasses, rum, tea, woolen cloth, cutlery, and other manufactured goods. New Englanders became strongly Federalist in opposition to the Jeffersonian Republicans of the South and even talked of secession. One broadside was spoken or sung in part, voicing these hard times and, and this humorous response. Our ships all in motion once whitened the ocean. They sailed and returned with their cargo. Now doomed to decay, they have fallen a prey to Jefferson, Worms, and Embargo. Um, and uh, coastal smug smuggling preceded the War of 1812. In 1809, Booth Bay fishermen sailed sloops and smuggled 200 quintals. And quintals, by the way, are generally, they, there are all sorts of different measurements for a quintal, but basically it's 220 pounds for a quintal or 44,000 pounds um, of fish uh, aboard a 52-ton sl sloop at Donaram which had sailed out of the Kennebec River. The ship hovered around Monhegan for a week and then departed for Demara in British Guiana where both vessel and cargo were sold for cash. In 1813, due to British clamping down on a blockade along the entire main coast, British sloops of war Rattler, Bream, and Liverpool Packet captured a number of Bristol, Booth Bay, and other coasters and fishermen and set those crews ashore on Damascove Island. Roger Duncan relates a humorous story and revealing prejudice in a story when a Cracker Barrel committee around a stove in the store at Round Pond hatched up a plan to capture the Bream. Commodore Tucker of Bremen and 45 men sailed the sloop increase to Booth Bay, borrowed several guns, and headed east in search of the Bream. Though the Bristol crew failed to find Bream, they had picked up a volunteer of swarthy complexion and gigantic stature, probably Peter Carey, the mulatto, and Mary Jane's crew when that ship had sailed down the Kennebec. As the Bristol vessel increased, bore down on the British vessel crown, the British captain surrendered and then declared, when I behold a throw on board of, of us through a space of 20 feet and heard his awful cry, Commodore, shall I heave? I thought the devil was coming after my vessel. <laughs> Soon after the British Rattler arrived at Booth Bay, landed a war party on Spruce Point one night, but was driven off by a Booth Bay militia. This event in 1814 involved the exchange of several shots between the British war vessel and Booth Bay militia at McFarland Point, near what is now downtown Booth Bay Harbor. The British ship ceased firing, tacked, and, and sailed around Spruce Point, out of the harbor, and into Linnacan Bay. On John Grover's property, formerly the old Alan Lewis place, stood the young boy, Joseph Grover, in front of his family home and brazenly discharged his musket at the Rattler. And he was just a teenager, young teenager. The British aboard their ship returned fire, striking Joseph in the head just before the harbor troops could reach the Grover property. They arrived just moments after and found the boy dead, so near the house that his brains and blood bespattered its walls. Joseph Grover was the sole loss of life in Booth Bay during this war of 1812. Um, and that's the same Grover family that runs Grover's Hardware today. Um, by the summer of 1814, it was time to halt the war as England was overextended and America's coast was blockaded. Commerce paralyzed, top masts down, and tar barrels inverted over lower mastheads to keep rain out of the wood. These upside down tar barrels, fittingly, were dubbed Madison's nightcaps. The War of 1812 was the dividing line between former turbulent centuries of hazard, bloodshed, and piracy and future trade waterways of the world, peaceful highways of the white-winged fleets of all nations. Roger Duncan discerned, Federalist opposition in Portland, Bath, Wiscasset, and Waldeboro was close to treasonous. The Hartford Convention in 1849 was close to secession. As this national gathering ended, as this unsuccessful attempt to nullify federal law and secede from the Union. By 1815, the return of peace damped the flames of party spirit and wakened to fresh life every enterprise. And this was noted by uh, Governor William Williamson. Um, and he was actually governor of Massachusetts when he was governor, 
because Maine wasn't separate from then at that time. A very popular governor and an incredibly good writer, wrote a two-volume history that I commend to anybody to read. It's a wonderful, uh, wonderful book written at the time. Um, and uh, he, he did, a, did a terrific, terrific two-volume history. Um, and uh, so he, Williamson had been actively engaged in the flames of parties of spirit spiraling and ebbing. With war over, the commerce resumed, vessels were in great demand, and shipbuilding, lumbering, and the cod fishery resumed with vigor in 1815. But the tide turned again. British cruisers began seizing American vessels with the end of the treaty between the Americans and British in 1815 with all sorts of negative ramifications. Plaster, used extensively by farmers in manuring and dressing their fields, had been sold by Maine farmers for more than $30 per ton, plummeted in price to half that sum as soon as transportation of this plaster from Nova Scotia fully resumed. Similarly, heavy European supplies of fabrics into America at this time reduced prices and discouraged home manufacturers and diminished material values and prices of mechanic labor wages in Maine. Merino sheep, treasured for decades, shrunk to less than half their former value as a result of mixtures with almost every flock in this eastern country, which Maine was called the eastern country. Mainer's hatred toward and desire for separation from Massachusetts harked back to early colonial times when the Massachusetts Bay Colony continually resurveyed its eastern line further and further east for mostly economic and control reasons to exploit and control profits related to fishing, coasting, and trade along the main coast and beyond. Brace yourself here. Masshole, a morphing of asshole, which derives from 1350 to 1400 Middle English arsehole, goes back many years and its meaning many centuries. Finally, in June of 2014, masshole was officially accepted into the English language by the Oxford English Dictionary. <laughs> what was even more funny was that the, uh, it, was, it was advertised immediately by the Boston Globe. So, um, Separation from Massachusetts had been discussed and threatened through violence at least back to the early 1700s by radicals known as Liberty Men. And I've written quite extensively about that uh, and, uh, and I'll cover it a little bit. Uh, later as well. More peaceful assemblies in favor of separation were chronicled by the newly established Falmouth Gazette when this newspaper was founded in 1784 in Portland, then called Falmouth. Massachusetts Federalists, though in the majority, were both anti-separation and fearful of the rapidly growing and outspoken Republican minority in Maine. Mainers were bitter against Massachusetts during and following the War of 1812 when the failure of Massachusetts to defend the District of Maine became clear, with Mainers perceiving Massachusetts to be more hindrance than help. Mr. Madison's war was particularly harsh on Mainers as reported by the New York Commercial Advertiser on May 12, 1813. The District of Maine has neither flour nor corn or even potatoes to live upon. The general poverty of the people produced by the anti-commercial policy and restrictive measures of the government has been greatly increased by the short crops of the last season and has at the same time rendered provisions scarce and dear and reduced the means of, this country, of the country people so low that they could not pay for them even if they were plenty and cheap. And that was in 1813. Brace yourselves, it's going to get worse. The War of 1812 through the Panic of 1819 may have been the worst of times for most Mainers ever. Ohio fever struck Maine by 1815, the infatuating spirit of emigration to the western states. The latter period of the War of 1812 had ended most commercial intercourse, including the lucrative coasting trade. The principal necessities of life were scarce and prices high. Polemic uh, political polemics reflected this terrible time, testified by Governor Williamson writing in 1832, the altercations of political parties so spirited, so obstinate, and so long protracted had become extremely tiresome and disgusting to all uninspiring men. Even worse, horrendous weather, probably our worst ever, sunk most Mainers into desperate poverty. The spring seasons were uncommonly cold and unpropitious. Particularly in the present summer of 1815, there was not a month without frost. 
Even more desperate, war and adversity had cast upon some a heavy weight of debt, and poverty had always been the lot of a still greater number, both classes having nothing to leave and, a, and little to carry with them. With promises of rich lands in Ohio and Kentucky, mild climates, long summers, and abundant and cheap breadstuffs and other food, the lower orders of society were put in motion, and nothing could break the spell of this current, which had burst its, its banks and could not be controlled nor diverted. Main poverty during the long winter of 1816-17 and beyond worsened incredibly. Not only was this winter the severest which had been experienced by the Eastern people for many years, the succeeding spring was very chilly and everything vegetable was backward. Wheat, rye, and corn were extremely scarce so that in many places it was impossible to procure a sufficiency for seed. Fears of famine before the close of another winter were widespread. Hundreds who had homes sold them for small considerations and lost no time in hastening away into a far country. Many estimated the loss of Mainers to Ohio fever between 10 and 15,000. Bristol inhabitants in 1816 suffered from a spring of this year that was cold and wet, delaying farmers from planting with particular Indian corn destroyed by the early frost. Bristol historian Johnston, writing 50 years later in 1873, quotes, it is believed there were some frosts on the low grounds in the town every month of the year. On the evening of June 6 or 8, snow fell so as to fairly whiten the ground. And he would have been talking with Bristol residents, you know, 50 years later, who would, who would have remembered that. So th these would have been first-hand accounts that he was reporting. Throughout New England, all planting in the spring of 1816 was doomed. Farmers complained that year about a backward spring with daily temperatures below freezing. Worse, in early June, an Arctic cold front froze the ground solid from Ohio across New England and as far south as New Jersey with snow across the north, including Maine. And that was in early June. People wore winter clothes, even in summer, gathered around fires and watched helplessly whatever they had tr struggled to replant, destroyed again by hard frost in July, August, and September. In October, the weather turned milder, mocking the ruined, and blackened fields. With no grain, many farmers had to slaughter remaining livestock, hogs, and cattle, which drove down meat prices that quickly rebounded to record levels by winter. This strange 1816 weather was worldwide, the year without a summer. At that time, an unaccountable global climate collapsed for all Maine settlers that year and the following year. Decades later, scientists could finally explain the 1816 phenomenon which was caused by the 1815 eruption of Indonesia's Mount Tambora, the largest worldwide volcanic event in over 1,300 years. The following year, the spring of 1817, brought no normalcy to northern New England when a strange high fog that dimmed sunlight, reddened sunsets, and highlighted sunspots continued the strange effects emanating from the other side of the planet. Famine, rather than prosperous harvests, spread from Europe to North America to China. Roughly 200,000 New Englanders sold or abandoned their farms and moved west. Americans after the American Revolution increasingly displayed their most pervasive single characteristic of the country, restlessness. Few people stayed still for long, geographically too. American population had zoomed 35% during the last decade of the 1700s and doubled the national population since 1775. American citizenship reserved citizenship to white men and women, though women were not citizens for voting purposes, while blacks did not achieve automatic citizenship until 1868, women in 1920, and Indians in 1924. However, just as in colonial times, Americans in 1820 continued to admit immigrants virtually without restriction, and newcomers continued to flock to America in ever-increasing numbers. This political pressure, this is by 1816, from Maine forced the general court to direct meetings to be held in every town and plantation of the District of Maine. Bristol voted twice in 1816, both votes overwhelmingly anti-separation, with the May 20 vote 13-4 and 37 against, and the September 6 vote 76-4 and 42 against separation. 
The district-wide votes in June were almost as overwhelmingly pro-separation, 10,393 in favor of separation and 6,501 opposed. However, there were well over three times that number of eligible voters, 37,828. Um, because a majority of Maine freemen had not voted, Maine senators and most representatives successfully passed a law through the Massachusetts General Court, effective June 20, 1816, directing Mainers to revote in September. Mainers did not give up on separation from Massachusetts and in 1818 overwhelmingly elected all separatist senators from the district and elected 114 representatives in favor of separation and a mere 13 opposed. By 1819, voters in Maine towns and plantations voted in July resoundingly in favor of separation, 17,091 to 7,132. That was a very quick change. Bristol flipped in favor of separation in 1819 by a vote of 80 to 50. The reason Bristol and other coastal towns reversed their votes between 1816 and 1819 was far more economic than political due to a recent change in the law of Congress. Vessels sailing from one state to another were not required to make regular entries and clearances as they had formerly been. Since the business of coasting from Maine port towns to Boston was and remained tremendously lucrative, this new congressional regulation removed any advantage of living in the District of Maine and being a citizen of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. And why do we refer to Maine as a state rather than as a Commonwealth? I was blown away by this when I was researching this. The draft constitution before this Maine Constitutional Assembly had been drafted to name Maine as a Commonwealth. Maine became a state rather than a Commonwealth like Massachusetts because on October 14, 1819, Mr. Parsons of Edgecombe, Josiah Parsons, an American Revolution pensioner who died seven years after 1819, on August 31, 1826, stood up in October of 1819 at the Maine Constitutional Convention at the Portland Courthouse and moved to strike Commonwealth and insert state. He expressed, his express reason was for saving time and expense in writing and printing. <laughs> Though almost certainly the true reason was Mr. Parsons and most Mainers wanted nothing to do with another pretentious Commonwealth. Opposed to Parsons included Mr. Preble of Portland, who favored Commonwealth, mostly on tradition and respectability, Judge Coney of Augusta on the same grounds of Mainers being an older people and part of an old Commonwealth, and Mr. Emery of Portland, who quoted dictionaries equating state with Commonwealth. Josiah Parsons countered, in common parlance, Maine would always be called a state. Why then should we style it a commonwealth? The vote was close, 119 to 113 in favor of Maine. Then Judge Daniel Coney urged and supported another motion to strike Maine and insert Columbus. Can you imagine <laughs> today? The state convention tabled this to the next day, October 15, when Judge Coney urged the rationale that this would be a long delayed act of justice in honor of Columbus. Judge Thatcher retorted that he did not wish to deprive old Columbus of any honors, but he had not discovered this part of the continent, nor, <laughs> nor did Columbus even know that the continent he discovered even extended to these northern latitudes. <laughs> As historian Lewis Hatch, writing in 1919, quipped, the convention was wisely of the same mind, and the motion to strike out Maine was lost, and the name of Columbus was rejected. The proponents of Commonwealth, some of the most prominent men in the convention, made yet another motion to reconsider and strike Maine and substitute Commonwealth, but lost. In the years between 1816 and 1821, six new states, including Maine, were created and admitted into the United States, and in size and power, it was like adding six new European countries. The sheer freedom of movement was staggering worldwide. Beginning in 1815, following the Battle of Waterloo, and accelerating through 1820, as told by world historian Paul Johnson. At this time, an Englishman, without a passport, health certificate, or documentation of any kind, without baggage for that matter, could hand over 10 pounds at a Liverpool shipping counter and go aboard. Upon arrival in America, he could go ashore without anyone asking him his business and then vanish into the entrails of the new society. The first check on this incredible influx of immigrants to America, the end of innocence, if you like, came with the catastrophic bank crash of 1819, the first financial crisis in America's history. Two years later, in 1821, the first Irish potato crop failed. 
Between 1810 and 1830, internal migration within the United States skyrocketed, especially settlers moving from New England's scarce land and from the Old South's exhausted land. Amidst this agricultural distress, Maine farmers incorporated an agricultural society on February 16, 1818, exclusively for the District of Maine, quotes, embracing men of most influence and most skillfulness in agriculture, close quotes. This banding together would lead to enhanced lobbying, marketing, and helpful exchanges of information for Maine farmers in the Maine legislature. This farming coalition created the Grange Movement, and in 1873, one of the first agricultural colleges in America. The weather in 1818 transformed to a summer season uncommonly fine, and the, yields, and the fields yielded abundance. Even the fishermen regained their cargoes captured during or after Mr. Madison's war. Midwives, well established in England by the 1730s, had achieved great acceptance, such as the popular, skilled, and busy Martha Ballad of Hallowell. And many of you have probably read Martha Ballad's diary. Are familiar with that? Yeah. Um, and uh, from 1785 to 1812, when she practiced midwifery and delivered many babies in mid Maine. But in 1820, midwives were competing with more male physicians and in a classic double bind. Women could not qualify themselves to practice midwifery without ma mastering general medicine, but learning general medicine would disqualify them as women and therefore as midwives. <laughs> this male-only med medical profession squeezed out most midwives as demonstrated in 1820 when a Harvard Medical School professor anonymously published a treatise arguing women should no longer be employed as midwives because their character would be destroyed by acquaintance with the dissections essential to thorough instruction in medicine. This is despite main midwives such as Martha Ballard, who for years had counted intestinal worms, prepared bodies for burial, and observed dissections. Martha died in May of 1812 at 77. Martha's husband, um, Ephraim Ballard, many of you probably have heard of him too. He was a surveyor and uh, very, very interesting. I'll, I'm just going to give you a quick squib about him. He was a surveyor as he surveyed for the great proprietors in Balltown, later Jefferson, in 1795 and 1802, incurred the wrath and physical violence of liberty men who were protecting their turf. Ephraim Ballard spent several times in a, in a debtor's prison in Augusta, which was not in any jail yard, but rather just an invisible boundary around the center of the town where he could post bond and get back to his surveying and other work to help pay off his debts pursuant to a 1767 law. Ephraim died at the age of 96 in 1821 amongst three generations of descendants. Um, and I'll just mention the, 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 this, this whole um, piece of... of you know, midwifery and, and so forth, it was just, um, you know, it was essential. It was just something that Mainers needed. They didn't have enough doctors around. But then when there began to be more doctors coming in, that's when things got a little bit polarized. But um, Bristol and Booth Bay residents, as well as in many other towns, witness experienced citizens who were suffering from intemper intemperance. Excessive drinking of alcohol in the 1820s is testified by Bristol historian John Johnston. Quotes, no place in all the country in the early times probably suffered more from the giant evil of intemperance than this town of Bristol. And the fact had long been felt and mourned. I think Booth Bay gave him a good run for the money. Uh, and it, when in the spring of 1828, the formation of temperance societies began to be generally advocated, very many here hailed the plan with joy and immediately resolved to lend their aid to the cause. Friends of this temperance movement met several Sunday mornings uh, evenings, I'm sorry, Sunday evenings at Damascotta Mills for public readings of Dr. Lyman Beecher's sermons on intemperance, and area residents called for formation of a temperance society. Similarly, from 1817 to 1830, Reverend Isaac Weston ministered to his Booth Bay congregational flock and noted the poor state of affairs in the town and in the church, mostly because of liquor consumption, but he noted that between 1831 and 1836, the reformatory process has wrought wonders. The principal means of industry and employment in 1820 since colonial settlement were hunting, fishing, lumbering, seafaring, and shipbuilding. By 1820, agriculture and manufacturing had joined these top ranks of main industries and employment. Farming was a necessity, vocation, and way of life, the essence of living for most Mainers since colonial times. 
Deborah Gould has published, and have you, are any of you familiar with Deborah Gould's books? Um, she, it's, she's a wonderful uh, historical novelist and uh, lives here in Midcoast, Maine. And uh, at the time that I wrote this, she had written two. I believe there are three. I, think I know I've read all three of them, uh, these historical novels. The first two were the Eastern and the Early Years and later on. She quoted the Pittston Town Meeting of April 15, 1821. Cattle should not run at large on the, in the Eastern River District. Any person so letting their cattle run at large shall be liable for a fine. She also quoted F. Eliphalet Crocker, a farmer in Hogreave for the Eastern River District. Hogs may go at large by being yoked and wrung according to law. Hogreaves harked back to colonial times, and I've written a lot about this guy, uh, uh, Abraham Sussman. Incredible, incredible stories there, but I'm just going to very briefly mention this. He, um, he was Waldeboro's only Jew. Uh, he was of Broad Bay, now Waldeboro, a wandering trader of some means who had fled his Hamburg ghetto and switched from peddling old clothes to tanning hides for leather goods and also a cooper of barrels. Sussman was poorly treated by Waldeboro, where he was elected Hoggreave for the town, either part of a pattern of persecution or the earthy humor of Waldeboro German peasant stock, according to Waldeboro historian and Bowdoin College professor Jasper Jacob Stahl. Anyway, Deborah Gould brings to life the details of farming around 1820 when Charles Call, a local farmer, like many others, had to acquire trash for his leftover hay, sell furs from his trap lines, and take a neighboring farmer's shaved shingles to eke out a living. Here's a snapshot. Everyone along Eastern had some, something to sell, it seemed, but roads were so wet, so muddy, the wagon wheels disappeared to the axle and nobody could get down to Dresden. You could lose a child in those ruts. Few roads in 1820 existed, and, it ex and its ex if extant, were in terrible condition. Waterways remained more commonly used than dirt roads. The great proprietor's agents dubbed the Sheepscot backcountry, just north of Newcastle, the grand seed plot of sedition and insurrection in 1800. At this time, the Sheepscot backcountry area had only tenuous links to the outside world. Only one road existed between Belfast on Penobscot Bay and Augusta and the Kennebec River, and even this road, built in 1795, was little more than a stump-strewn path running through wilderness of swamps without any bridges, as one settler put it. General Knox and, and other great proprietors built roads in the backcountry in the hopes that they would corrode libertarian notions of the settlers and would re replace dis disorganizing squatters with orderly newcomers and, and smother the avarice of democracy. And this is similar works, uh, uh, writings were from uh, John Adams also, um, when he had to come up here to, to Maine uh, to uh, argue cases. Um, am I running out of time? Because I, I just don't want to overdo this. I don't have much more to go, but I I'm also... Ten, ten more minutes. Okay. Steamboats with summer tourists may have reached Booth Bay and Bristol as early as the 1820s. Even Boston had no steamboat facilities until 1817, merely a daily summer service to Nahant. Um, then uh, the main corporation, 1824, a main corporation established a steamboat line from Boston down east. There's a whole story about that too, but this is just a summary. With a New York built steamboat patent departing Boston every Tuesday from Portland and Bath, just upriver from Booth Bay and the Bristol Peninsulas. In Bath, one could transfer to the steamboat Maine, a colloquial product of two schooners' hulls, fastened catamaran fashion, for Booth Bay, Owlshead, Camden, Belfast, Sedgwick, Cranberry Isles, Lubeck, and Eastport. This was a steamboat journey consumed five days with tourists spending nights in these harbors along the coast. And that was in 1824. In 1833, uh, I won't go into that, hired farmhands in Maine often were called lazy idlers, loiterers, and hangers-on, as well as prone to alcohol. During the 1820s and 1830s, debates in Maine raged as to whether boys could farm and get in the hay without the stimulating influence of ardent spirits. Some farmers even advertised for a good ditcher who could keep sober. So we still hear these stories. Um, America, shortly after the American Revolution and by the early 1800s, had shed many colonial words of status, such as husbandman, yeoman, and esquire, and took up citizen a decade before the French revolutionaries did. Collectively, citizens became known in America as the public. 
Maine had a long history with much higher doses of egalitarianism and far lower contagions of status than Massachusetts and other places. Benjamin Tibbetts, and he's just an incredible story. Uh, Booth Bay's native son, born in the fertile Dover area of Booth Bay and the sixth of nine children, and Liberty's adopted son, Benjamin Tibbetts, exemplified this egalitarianism and independence during his century-long lifespan between 1785 and 1885. Mostly Ben Tibbetts, just before and after 1820, showed us what it took to survive as an excellent seaman who had reserved during Mr. Madison's war under Captain Rose and to live free just up the Sheepscot River in Liberty, then a village in the fast-growing and brand-new incorporated town of Montville, formerly Davistown Plantation, in Maine. I've written much of Ben Tibbetts elsewhere, but let's allow two-time Pulitzer Prize-winning historian Alan Taylor, a native of Maine, sum up Benjamin Tibbetts' remarkable life and example around 1820 at the beginning of Taylor's first incredible book, Liberty Men. This study examines four phenomena that converged in Benjamin Tibbetts' life. Migration to the frontier, labor applied to wilderness land to create property, a spiritual search for divine meeting, and organized resistance to the great proprietors. Widespread in mid-Maine, the settlers' resistance began in the 1760s, lapsed when the revolution seemed to sweep away the proprietary claims, and revived in the 1790s, after the proprietors reasserted their demands for payment. Initially, the insurgents called themselves liberty men, or sons of liberty, defenders of a revolution betrayed by America's great men. But their foes called them white Indians on account of their disguises and their supposed savagery. Over time, especially after 1800, the most militant settlers adopted the name of white Indians and elaborated a protest culture of mock Indian costumes and rituals. Benjamin Tibbetts spent far more days felling timber, hoeing cornfields, and breaking steers than he did mobbing land agents. But from time to time, he had to become a white Indian to defend the property his labor created. And uh, he, he was just a, an incredible person, and that's another talk in and of itself. But Booth Bay may become one of the top three shipping centers along the main coast, or may have been the three, uh, top three shipping centers along the coast during this period. Um, and finally, um, Maine life around 1820 was a terrifying and exhilarating time in the state's history and in our nation's history, with waves and ripples lapping European shores and beyond. Missouri, in February of 2018, I'm sorry, of 1819, had, remanded, had demanded to become a state as its population had passed the 60,000 mark when the United States tenuously held on to its 11 slave and 11 free states. Through 1819, no attempt had been made to extend slavery into the Louisiana Purchase Territory, let alone beyond it. Though pioneers were rapidly settling the territory, Missouri already had 10,000 slaves and were acquiring more. Thomas Jefferson, as some of you may know, penned a note on April 22, 1820 to a friend, John Holmes, in the question of Missouri's admission to the Union. This momentous question, like a fire bell in the night, awakened and filled me with terror. I considered it at once as the, as the knell of the Union. We are facing constant challenges and daunting ones during these trying days of political and social turmoil. And I wrote this before the pandemic. But we have the lenses of history to instruct and help us recognize our times as not the worst of times. May history guide us to find calmer waters, gentler breezes, and a strange holiness in our common days on common ground. Thanks. Time for questions? Yes. Okay. Yes. Chip, around the 1820s, what percentage of this mid-coast area were Scots Irish? A heavy percentage, um, because we're talking about post, uh, there were sort of two, um, well, uh, two or three early settlings, uh, uh, if you will. You had Pemaquid, uh, which is more an outpost, um, and it wasn't, it, it they did have farmers uh, who were farming land there, though, as well. Um, and you had uh, a failed settlement in Booth Bay uh, at Oak Point. Uh, has there, anybody ever been at Oak Point uh, Preserve? It's, it's where the uh, center is there now in, in Booth Bay. Um, and it, the, it, it's a drop-dead gorgeous spot. You can go in, in by Townsend Gut 
and, uh, and, and remember the waterways were the highways, that's how they got there. Just an incredible place, and, it, and you can still see at low tide a lot of the old wooden piers that went way, way, way out into the, into the water. Um, and that was uh, really intensively uh, uh, farmed and fished. So, uh, but, and, and, and Bristol had similar um, communities, but the first effective settlements didn't happen until 1729, 1730. Um, and that's when the mostly Scots-Irish folks came. Um, and they, that was the first effective settlement. And there's a doctrine, somewhat controversial, but there's a doctrine that was only coined um, in the 1980s, I think, something like that, that, that says if a particular culture settles in a frontier area, um, that culture is going to predominate over the centuries, no matter who joins it later. They're essentially going to be co-opted into that culture. Um, I, I, I subscribe to a lot of that. It doesn't answer everything, but, you know, look at, uh, God, my wife's from New York in, in, in Westchester County, New York. I mean, God, talk about still a Dutch culture there. And, uh, and, and her parents didn't, and grandparents only, only uh, came during World War II. Um, during during the fighting, they were actually shot at as they were they were coming in. So the point is is that culture can really uh, be very very powerful, and I would say the other, but it's not everywhere in Maine. I mean, uh, for example, the two primary cultures I think that are still sort of competing is the ones that have always competed: the Scots Irish uh, and the and the um, uh, Puritan culture. Camden is a great example. Camden's Puritan. Uh, look at just towns side by side uh, in, in Portland. Um, Portland is definitely Puritan, but right next to it, you've got two towns that are Scots-Irish through and through. And they've always been very different. They've always kind of known that, but they didn't know why, really. Um, and uh, so, uh, so, so there are, um, the, the, that can be full of all sorts of debate and, and discussion, but um, I find that a helpful but not complete answer to a lot of the, the, the rules. But for example, to give you an example, I mean, the, the, in, in, uh, uh, up in uh, Balltown, which is now uh, Whitefield and Jefferson, uh, they still call them white, white, you know, rednecks with snow tires, you know? And they say that same about people in Booth Bay and Bristol too, a lot of times. But, uh, but the point is, is that um, there is an ethos there that continues, and um, whether or not you agree with it or don't, that's not the point. The culture is there, and uh, and uh, so I, I I think that's something that may be helpful to to try to um, because the, the Puritans had very good points too. They were very strong on education. Scots Irish never were, and similarly the. Um, the egalitarian nature was very strong with 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 the, with the Scots Irish, and wasn't with the Puritans. And so, you know, I think there were strengths and weaknesses for both cultures, and there are tons of other cultures, of course, here in Maine and everywhere else. And Colin Wooder has written very, very effectively on that nationwide, as well. But um, yes. Years old. Yes. And you wonder if some of the stories are true. Like, my, I have a sister who has a home on West Harbor Pond. She only stays there in the summer. Huh. She comes up from Boston. She lives in Newton, Mass. And all these stories are about how British ships, you know what the causeway is that goes towards West Harbor Pond? Pond? Yeah, West Harbor Pond. Yep. Supposedly, and this is what a lot of people, other people on the street have talked about this too, that British ships came in to Booth Bay Harbor, and that hot pond. It used to be part of the ocean, I guess, until they blocked it off the causeway, and now it's spring fed. But yeah. there were ships, British ships there, and they said something about the people, this is, I don't know if this is true, if you've heard about this, people were blockading the ships in with, with lumber and wood and tree, cut down trees, and the British threatened to burn the town down if they didn't undo it. Yeah. And I guess in order to get the boats up high enough to leave, they were throwing things off the boats, the British. 
and I've heard people say that they've found things. Now that was like 50 years ago. Now they yeah. probably wouldn't. It, it, it could be true. Is that a true uh, it certainly is well, true they that. Were it, it, it's certainly true that there was, and, and Barbara Rumsey's tried to locate it. She's our historian in, in, in Booth Bay Harbor, and she hasn't been able to fix exactly where they were, but most people do believe that, that there was um, uh, a lot of patriots in the woods there, um, and, and that was uh, a highway. Basically, it's a waterway, and, and, and there was no no bridge or anything like that until the late 1800s, early 1900s. So, so um, and, and they definitely were using that area um, during the War of 1812. Um, and well, most likely during the Revolutionary War too. I guess the reason I ask is you tell these stories, you know some of them are myths. No, no, this isn't pure myth at all. Oh, that yeah. Is a, yeah, that you know that's an that's a really interesting one. That's on the Eddy Road, and yeah, and that's that house. Um, there's there's a lot. Th th there may be some truth to it, but I don't know for sure. Um, but uh, the the Marie Antoinette was supposedly going to escape from France and come to uh, Edgecombe, um, where where the Marie Antoinette house uh, was always located. Yeah. Yeah, but that's, I don't think anybody's ever going to be able to prove that one way or the other, but I, I'm, I'm ambivalent on it. I'm not really sure. Other, other qu good questions. Any, any others? Yeah. I haven't been in the state that long, but when did the economy switch from ships and the coastal economy uh, to inland more? Is this with the advent of the steam engine or what was the... Uh, you know, well, see, let's, yeah. Ships, I guess, uh, still, you know, sitting at harbor or someplace. Well, I think the Erie Canal was a big, big step in that direction. <coughs> so you could have more inland waterways being used for, further into the country. Um, but I don't think that's what really destroyed shipping. Um, I think that it was really technology, you know, and, and uh, particularly in the, I mean, the, the, the glory days here were really in the late 1800s or mid to late 1800s, early 1900s. But still, there were recessions and other things that happened during all of that. But the, the, those were, um, those are areas for Bristol and Booth Bay that were really strong. But then, you know, we started having steel and fabrication and, and all sorts of other things going on. So then they started doing the same thing, but, or they, meaning people along the main coast, would start building other types of smaller boats often, um, and very quickly uh, for tourism too. Uh, so it, it, it's, a, it, it's a complex web, really, but it definitely was a huge, huge shift um, from the real, the real uh, successful decades of particularly shipbuilding and fishing and trade all over the world. I mean, and the other thing is that people don't realize is that many, many folks, just common sailors would be going all over the world. And believe me, that really, you read some of their letters, they got it. I mean, they were with all sorts of different nationalities and colors and all that and, and, uh, and, and had really good friendships. And, and so, you know, I think in many ways, we are more insular now than during the heyday of the late 1880s, early 1900s. Um, One time I think I remember reading about the triangular trade. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, our, our place here in England and down to the Caribbean. Correct. The Caribbean That's right. Yep. And there's a lot the, 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 there's st there the still is, but, but, but the triangular trade uh, was very, very strong for centuries, really. Um, 1600s, 1700s, 1800s, 1900s, and even in the 2000s. Yeah. Uh, so that's still, that, that's still a powerful, powerful trade. Yes? I just, want, I just have a comment, and that is I was very um, glad to hear you discuss the... Um, 
this the year I think you said it was eighteen sixteen yeah fifteen mm -hmm. or eighteen sixteen when there was frost every month of the year it was two years oh two years yeah um, and um, I think that seems to be something that not that many historians have focused on or don't know very much about because at one time I wanted to have a Mm. a uh, program that was basically built around that, that was a tremendous economic change in the state. And, yeah. um, and evidently from what you said, not just here, but throughout the northern states that existed at that time. And um, we couldn't find anybody who had enough information about it to yeah. put a program together. Yeah, M more people are coming out with it now. There was, um, this is by Dennis Mercero and um, uh, and, and it's related to the um, uh, genealogical and whatever society in Boston. Uh, I, I can't remember the full name of the. Maybe it's maybe it's here somewhere. But um, but anyway, uh, just very very briefly, I'll just read you the highlights. There are 15 uh, pieces. Mount Tambora's eruption lasted nearly two weeks. Two Tambora's explosion was worse than some better known eruptions. Three, it caused a volcanic winter. Four, Tambora's eruption caused a snow day in June. Five, the cold ki killed crops across Europe and Asia. Six, diseases spread around the world. Seven, Mount Tambora's eruption gave us Frankenstein. That's another <laughs> whole thing. Uh, eight, and epic sunsets. Um, nine, the eruption may have encouraged Mormonism. Uh, <laughs> ten, the... Uh, uh, and... Uh, uh, I said, uh, founder Joseph Smith's family was one of thousands that left Vermont during the freakishly cold summer of 1816. The Smith family subsequently settled in New York, where teenage Joseph would go on to experience the events that led to his publication of the Book of Mormon, so I don't know. <laughs> but anyway, 10, the, the year without a summer helped the invention of the bicycle, uh, and it was an interesting uh, little squib on that. And then 11, crop failures found, uh, put a founding father further into debt. That was Jefferson. Twelve, the cold, uh, the cool down led to a new era in Arctic exploration. Um, and then 13, the decline of agriculture boosted the opium trade. Um, and uh, as I said, after the crops failed in 1816, farmers in places like China were forced to begin growing opium to make money. This opium production led to a boom in the opium trade that still exists today. 14, Earth's atmosphere quickly recovered. Um, 15, an eruption like Tambora could happen again, but probably won't in our lifetimes. <laughs> so for whatever that's worth, but, but that comes from a really good uh, historical and genealogical society that I subscribe to in, in Boston. But um, anyway, good question. Okay. Oh, okay. Thank you.